As we have seen in recent episodes of Tales from the Hangman's Record, fate can play a decisive part in all our lives. Some days this can work in our favour, other times it can be the opposite, with dire consequences. Today's episode features one such case. A hard-working family man and father of six, finding himself in the wrong place at the wrong time, and doing what he believed to be his public duty, led to him being callously shot down in the street and resulting in one of the most iconic scene of crime photographs in the annals of Scotland Yard. The planning was almost complete. Three days earlier, they had broken into a gunsmith shop near London's Waterloo station and stolen a number of pistols and ammunition. Now they were ready. On Tuesday morning, the 29th of April, 1947, the three men met up in Whitechapel and travelled together by underground to Gooch Street. Their target was one of the many pawn and jeweller shops around the bustling Tottenham Court Road and after an hour of checking out shop windows, they found a suitable mark. They retired to a cafe for some lunch and suitably refreshed, they were now ready to find a getaway vehicle. One was quickly located on Whitfield Street and a short time later, the black Vauxhall 14 saloon was positioned outside, ready for a speedy getaway. Now it was time. Slipping knotted handkerchiefs over the lower part of their faces, two of the men headed for the front door. Staff at J's Jewellers, 73 and 75 Charlotte Street in London's West End were back from lunch and ready for the afternoon trade when suddenly, at a few minutes after two, the side door was flung open. Proprietor Alfred Stock sized up the situation in an instant. Although the man was wearing a face mask and brandishing a pistol, he decided he wasn't simply going to hand over the takings of valuable goods to a young thug. Seconds later, the front door burst open and two more men entered, pointing guns and demanding money. One vaulted the counter. As he did so, Alfred Stock slammed the safe door shut and in doing so received a blow from the handle of the gun that knocked him bleeding to the ground. Despite the chaos in the shop, 70-year-old manager Bertram Keyes calmly reached down and pressed the alarm button. Panic immediately spread amongst the thieves. This was certainly not what they had imagined at all. By wielding guns and issuing threats, their surmise the staff would meekly do as they were told. Then, when Manager Keats picked up his wooden stool and hurled it at them, one of the men fired, and, narrowly missing, the bullet nestled into the wall just above Keats's head. Within seconds, the thieves backed out into the street, empty-handed apart from a couple of items of silver one of them had snatched from the window. As robberies went, it had been pretty much a farce. But up to now, although stock had been battered and bruised, no one had been seriously hurt. Rushing into the crowded street, they had now found a more serious problem. They jumped into the stolen car, carefully parked ready for their swift escape, only to find it boxed in by a delivery lorry. As the alarm bell rang noisily and staff rushed out in pursuit, the gang fled on foot, scattering passers-by as they shouted and waved their guns. Motorcyclist Alec de Antiquis, a 36-year-old father of six, worked as a mechanic and ran a small repair shop in Collier's Wood. He was travelling down Tottenham Street, past the jewellers, when he saw the men burst out of the shop and make their escape. Swinging onto the pavement at the junction with Charlotte Street, he stood astride his powerful motorbike, blocking the path of the fleeing robbers. Ignoring their shouts to get out of the way, he paid for his courageous attempt to stop them with a bullet to the head. Women screamed as he fell to the ground, mortally wounded. The gang crossed the busy road and turned into Charlotte Mews. It was a dead end. Doubling back, they continued on Tottenham Street, dropping some of the stolen silver before crossing Whitfield Street and disappearing into the crowds on Tottenham Court Road. A number of passers-by attempted to make them uncomfortable as they waited for an ambulance, whilst a newspaper photographer captured the moment scheduled for the newspaper headlines. Ali de Antiquis died on the way to hospital. Due to staff holidays at Scotland Yard, Robert Fabian, 
was now the acting chief superintendent in charge of the entire West End district and was having a late lunch when the call came through. Fabian immediately summoned his team to the scene, including Detective Inspectors Bob Higgins and Fred Hodge. They began by taking statements from the 27 witnesses who had been either in the shop or on the street when the gunman fled. Unfortunately for the detectives, the statements, apart from confirming it was three white males, mostly contradict each other on everything from height, age, clothing and even hair colour. One witness said that as the three bandits were fleeing, he tripped one up, but as he went to make a citizen's arrest, another kicked him to the ground and helped his accomplice to escape. The brutal killing with the historic and poignant photograph hit the front page of the newspapers across the country and soon police received a vital lead. A London taxi driver came forward to say that on the afternoon of the murder, a man had tried to hail his cab and had jumped on the running board. As he already had a fur, he refused him a lift and watched him step back down into the road and then, along with an accomplice, enter an office block called Brook House on Tottenham Court Road next door to Heal's department store. Both men appeared to have knotted handkerchiefs around their necks and were clearly in a hurry. Detectives went to the offices at 191 Tottenham Court Road and spoke to 16-year-old Brian Cox, who told them that on that afternoon he had seen two men enter and head for the stairs. Cox said they had asked him where they could find a Mr Williams, and when told he didn't know, they continued to head to the upper floor. The young lad was also able to add that when the two men left the building, one of them was no longer wearing a fawn overcoat he previously had on. The caretaker also aided the police by showing them a key he had found while sweeping up on the previous evening. None of the staff recognised it, but Fabian felt it might be the one that fitted the stolen Vauxhall, and a check with the car, which had been taken to the police laboratory for a thorough examination, found it was the right key. This almost certainly now confirmed that the two men in the office block were involved in the shooting. Searching an empty office on the upper floor, detectives discovered a raincoat, complete with knotted handkerchief, stuffed inside a chimney. It seemed the owner had tried to conceal its identity by removing all the visible labels inside the coat, but unknown to him, inside the lining was a telltale manufacturer's label. Fabian knew if he could trace the owner of the raincoat, it would go a long way in solving the murder. He put his officers onto the case, and soon they were able to say it was part of a batch that had been delivered to a store on Deptford High Street. Post-war London was still a time of clothing coupons and shortages, and as a result, shopkeepers were obliged to record the name and address of every purchaser. The court was logged in the book as being sold in December 1946, and led police to an address in Bermondsey. Fabian went to the house and was told by a woman living there that the raincoat belonged to her husband, but had recently been stolen while they were in a pub. He posted one of his men to keep an eye on the address, and no sooner had Fabian departed than the woman followed him outside and crossed through the bomb streets to an address in an adjacent block. Investigations discovered that she had visited the Jenkins family, who were well known to Scotland Yard. The eldest son, Thomas, was currently serving eight years for manslaughter, having been involved in a murder case in December 1944. Another son had recently been discharged from Barstow. Fabian discovered that the woman at the Bermondsey address was Jenkins' sister, and so decided to intercept her husband on the way home from work to hear his version of how the raincoat was lost. The man said it had been stolen while at the cinema. Told this contradicted what his wife has alleged, there was a number of further denials before admitting his wife had lent the coat to her brother, Harry Jenkins. Charles Henry Jenkins, Harry to his friends, was a 23-year-old petty crook with a record of violence that included serious assault against a policeman and had only been released from Borstal two weeks ago. As investigations into the rain court continued, a gun was found in the mud on the banks of the Thames, close to Jenkins' parents' house. Ballistics expert Robert Churchill found that this had been the murder weapon. On the following day, a second gun was discovered a little further downstream on the same stretch of the river. Churchill was again able to confirm that this gun had fired the bullet found inside the jeweller's shop. Jenkins was taken into custody and when shown the raincoat, admitted it looked familiar but added, I'm not saying any more now as all this looks serious to me. Jenkins was placed in identity parade, but none of the 27 witnesses 
who had given statements on the afternoon of the murder, was able to pick him out and he was allowed to leave. He remained under surveillance as evidence was built up, tracing his friends and accomplices. It was soon clear that the two likely associates were 20-year-old Christopher James Garrity and 17-year-old Terence Peter Rolt. Garrity, like Jenkins, had a long police record and had also served a number of terms in Borstal. With no evidence at this stage to pull them in, Fabian maintained surveillance on Garrity and Rolt while calling Jenkins back in to make a further statement on the raincoat. This time he told a different story, claiming he had loaned the raincoat to a petty thief and fence called Bill Walsh. We saw him about a week ago in South End. He's knocking around with a girl who works in a cafe there, Jenkins said. Fabian later recorded that he was amazed at this statement, as, although Jenkins was a crook, a thief and a gangster, he would never betray a comrade. And this was a dangerous betrayal, as the man who had the raincoat last was the likely murderer. Walsh was a convict on licence and had already broken his parole by failing to report to the police. Fabian, Higgins and Hodge travelled to South End where they looked through the bulky pages of the police routine books. There they discovered that at 9.40 on April the 25th, a police officer reported the suspicious behaviour of two young men and noted their names as Christopher James Garrity and Michael Joseph Gillum. A search of South End cafes located the waitress and when officers went to talk to her, they learned that Bill Walsh had been in South End on April 25th with Harry Jenkins. 37-year-old Bill Walsh had then disappeared, and it transpired Walsh had double-crossed Jenkins. They had done a robbery together, and Walsh had ran off with the loot. For the rest of the day, the detective searched every house in South End where Walsh was known to have friends. In one, they struck Lucky, unearthing two watches stolen in an armed robbery at a London jeweller's shop four days before the murder of Alec Antiquis. Fabian now organised a search for Bill Walsh and three days later he was picked up in Plumstead near his home. What do you want me for? Walsh asked when questioned. Surely not all this fuss about dodging my ticket of leave. It could be for armed robbery or it could be for murder, Fabian told him. It depends on you and what you know. Walsh asked for a glass of water and then began to talk. He denied that he'd ever borrowed a raincoat from Jenkins or his sister. Walsh said that he had discussed the Jay's hold-up before it happened with Jenkins, Garrity and someone else who had later backed out. But, he was adamant, all he did was check the shop out five days before the robbery. He was not one of the gunmen and Fabian believed him. Walsh then admitted the robbery in Queensway. He said that along with Garrity, Jenkins and a lad called Joe, they had robbed a jeweller at gunpoint. They got away with £5,000 worth of rings and watches and after the robbery the gang went to South End where Walsh admitted absconding with all the stolen jewellery. This was why Jenkins had betrayed him. Joe was identified as Michael Joseph Gillum, another ex barstool boy and he was quickly picked up. A short time later, Gillum and Walsh were tried and sentenced to five years at the Central Criminal Court for the Queensway robbery. Fabian and his team knew that to break a chain, they had to find its weakest point. Jenkins was not weak, and so they turned to Garrity. He was arrested and taken into the station, where he made a brave show of ease, fidgeting with his lank fur hair, and with eyes that became defiant when the officer casually mentioned Harry Jenkins. Fabian knew that Jenkins and Garrity were close friends, and these two ex barstool lads would not betray each other. Their sad and ultimately doomed underworld friendship no less sincere from being darkened by criminality. The experienced detective reasoned it would be pointless to get him to testify against Jenkins, so asked him about Terry Rolt. That did it. Garrity had no qualms in betraying Rolt, a new member of the gang who he saw as an insignificant small fry and little more than a child. In a long and detailed statement, Garrity damned Rolt, but whenever it came to Jenkins, Garrity paused, adding carefully, that other fellow whose name I don't want to mention. Garrity told how he and Rolt and the other fellow had broken into a gunsmith and stolen the pistols and the ammunition. Two days later, on the Tuesday, they headed to Good Street, where they got out and checked several jeweller shops around Tottenham Court Road before settling on Jay's. Rolt was sent to peer into the jeweller's window 
and value the property, and came back saying it was worth £2,000 and wondered if it was worth robbing. Meanwhile, Jenkins went to steal the car. Then Rolt, in a highly nervous state, rushed into the shop, pulling out his gun, and the others followed. Blows were struck, stools thrown, and a shot boomed out. The three accomplices made their escape, the brave allied antiquist loomed up and was shot down. The gangsters were now murderers on the run. And with Garrity's statement, Fabian arrested Rolt on the following morning. Told that his friend had accused him of being responsible for the murder and robbery, Rolt contested this and in his statement implicated Jenkins. He also claimed it was Garrity that had shot dead Ali de Antichrist. Jenkins was picked up on the following day and taken to Tottenham Court Road Police Station. At 7.30 on the evening of Monday, May the 19th, all three were formally charged with murder. It was just 20 days since the crime. A large crowd gathered as the three were led away to Brixton Prison, where they were held until their trial. There was a number of remands over the summer before the three were arranged to stand trial before Mr Justice Hallett at the Old Bailey in July. Mr Anthony Ork and Henry Hellum led for the Crown, while each of the three defendants had their own counsel. Russell Vick represented Jenkins, Paul Wright and Garrity, and Richard O'Sullivan defended Rolt. In a trial that was to last six days, neither Garrity nor Rolt chose to give evidence, while Jenkins claimed he had an alibi for the time of the murder. Garrity's counsel pleaded manslaughter and claimed that when he had fired the shot, it was meant as a warning and he had aimed it into the air and not at the victim. On Friday the 26th of July, the proceedings were adjourned for the weekend and the prisoners were taken by car to Brixton Prison. On Sunday evening, Garrity penned his thoughts on how he felt the trial was progressing. It has been suggested that I should record my feelings and thoughts while I am standing trial for my life. This I shall endeavour to do, although it is difficult to label each thought into separate compartments as each overlap and twist into others. From the moment Antichrist fell from his motorbike, everything went as if in a realm of fiction. Nothing seemed to be real anymore. As the papers wrote about the crime and the manhunt, I could not grasp that the man they were hunting for was myself. I went to make my ordinary business as though nothing had happened, yet in the back of my mind was this fantasy. When I was detained for the first time, there was no fear, because it was not real. It was just as though I was reading a good book. My appearances in the police court were a drama staged from Edgar Wallace. A month or so in Brixton went quickly until the night before my trial, and as I lay in bed, like a thunderbolt it struck me, I was on trial for my life. When the morning came, it was like any other until the car came to take me to the Old Bailey. Then I was frightened, my mind clutching at straws, if that, if the other. In the dock, my first day was sheer hell. When would they finish? Disjointed thoughts, that second one from the front row of the jury looks hard, women are supposed to be alright, and so on. The second day was different. I was taking an avid interest in the case, every point I seized upon, hoping. Then I heard one sentence that changed the all of my outlook. If a man dies on a felony, and his death takes place as a result of that felony, whether intended or not, it is murder. I lost interest in the case. My thoughts swung to the other extreme, became gloomy. What was death like? How would I take the sentence? I was frightened, but a stubborn pride made me say to myself, I might be so, but I'm not going to let those bastards see it. As I waited for the car that night, then I learned what regret was, what agony reminiscences were. My last date, the park in the summer, a pub on a Friday night, smoke on the ceiling and a piano playing boogie woogie, the hubbub of voices, things I'd never considered before, just accepted as my right. There is a saying that the only man who appreciates liberty is the man who has lost it. The same might be said about life by a man who is going to lose it. Because the day is sunny, that day is a luxury to him. A cigarette is enjoyed more because there might be no more. The third day I came into court resigned. I was more or less normal, regretting, but it was too late for regrets. I would not show that I did regret it, as it would be put down as sheer hypocrisy. If they thought that I was a hard, callous criminal, well, I would be the last to disappoint them. 
I could look around and admire the pretty women in court, glad to see some colour and life, although disapproving of the motives that brought them. I had often thought of going to a murder trial, never visualising that the only one I would ever see would be my own. For the fourth and fifth day, everything seemed pretty much the same. Now I am waiting for tomorrow when I shall be sentenced. Tonight, listening to the radio, I heard a song called Santa Lucia. When it swelled forth, I knew that I'd found something that I would shortly lose. Until now, I had thought nothing of real music. Common, everyday tunes were enough for me. There comes a time in most human lives when they change from adolescent to adult almost overnight. This happened to me. Before, I was an adolescent who was way too big for his shoes. Overnight, I became a man. A thought came from the Bible. When I was a child, etc. All this time, I have never thought of religion. For all my life, I have been a pagan. And I shall die one. I had never much use for organised religion, and I have no use for it now I am about to die. The only regret now is that I have wasted 20 years of my life, and I have thrown away the other 50. Monday the 29th of July was the sixth and final day of the trial and it was time for Mr Justin Elliott's summing up which left nobody in court in any doubt as to what he felt the verdict should be. It is not every day, thank God, that innocent people are shot down in the streets of London as occurred here. I describe this affair as an outrage. What else could it be called? It was just 90 days since the murder and the jury took only four hours to find all three guilty. Rolt, at 17, being too young to face a death penalty, was to be detained at His Majesty's pleasure for a minimum of five years. Jenkins and Geraghty were sentenced to death. Both appealed their convictions that the verdict was unsatisfactory on the grounds of a lack of malice. Also that the judge had misdirected the jury as to the law and the facts, and that the judge was biased. In a letter to his parents, Geraghty said the whole appeal had been a charade, and from the way the judge spoke, he gave the impression he was Frankenstein. Letters were sent out to hangman Albert Pierpoint and assistants Harry Critchell, engaged in the case of Geraghty, and Harry Allen, who was to help hang Jenkins. A few hours before he walked to the gallows, Geraghty penned a last letter in which he lamented, My early environment taught me that you had to fight or go down. I fought for things I would never have got any other way. On Friday morning, the 19th of September 1947, Harry Jenkins and Christopher James Garrity were hanged side by side at Pentonville Prison. There are a number of interesting postscripts to this sad tale. On the afternoon of the murder, a man was making his way to the Fitzroy Tavern, a few blocks away from Jay's Jewellers, having just been on some official business at the War Office when his journey was interrupted by a police roadblock as the hue and cry went up following the shooting. Reaching his destination, he discovered he had witnessed a start of the investigation into the murder of Alec de Antiquis. Five months later, he was to play his part in the last part of this tragedy. The passerby that day was hangman Albert Pierpoint. Two years later, Sir Harold Scott, Metropolitan Police Commissioner, gave evidence before the Royal Commission on Capital Punishment when he referenced the murder of Alan de Antiquis. He said, There was a case of shot breaking in London in 1944. A passerby, Captain Ralph Binney, died from his injuries when he tried to stop the thieves' car. Ronald Headley, the driver, was convicted of murder and one of his companions, Thomas James Jenkins, of manslaughter. Headley's death sentence was commuted to penal servitude for life and Jenkins, the brother of Harry Jenkins, was sentenced to eight years penal servitude. All the persons concerned in this and the subsequent Antiquist case were associates and lived in the Bermondsey district. They had formed themselves into a gang of criminals and, as events have proved, there was no limit to the steps they would take to avoid capture. After the result of the case against Headley and Thomas became known, their associates again came out into the open and began to be actively involved in crime. Some of them were arrested and sentenced to various terms of imprisonment but they still continued living their life of crime. Then came the carrying out of the death sentence on Charles Henry Jenkins and Christopher James Geraghty. Almost immediately, the gang disbanded. 
They had not been seen in their usual haunts since and as far as is known are not engaged in criminal pursuits. Following the death of Captain Binney, it was decided to strike a medal in his name and present it to members of the London public who have performed the bravest deeds in support of law and order. The first recipient of this award was Alec de Antiquis. It was also later revealed that his wife and the mother of their six children would receive a pension of £100 a year and each child would receive £18 a year up to the age of 16. Terence Rolt served nine years in prison, being released in 1956. His mother was reported in the press that she was worried about reprisals from friends of the two who had been hanged. I could find no evidence of any such action. Rolt married in 1969 and died in 2008. And finally, in 1950, Ealing Films released the fabulous police procedural film, The Blue Lamp, which to anyone familiar with the Alec Antiquist case, the comparisons in the plot are plentiful. Starting with the shooting of a man attempting to make a citizen's arrest as the credits run, there is a still from the iconic scene of crime photograph. With a plot that involves a jewel shop robbery and the tracking down of a raincoat, it's easy to see Garrity and Jenkins portrayed in the characters of Spud and Tom Riley, as played by Patrick Doonan and Dirk Bogart. A highly recommended film for anyone who may not have seen it. There is little doubt all were guilty as charged, and robbing a young family of six children of their father was never going to garner much sympathy from a public who was still trying to get back to normality after six years of war. It was also an offence that would have carried the death penalty until abolition in the 1960s. What I found quite moving when researching the case were the letters penned by Jim Garrity describing his thoughts as he awaited the inevitable death sentence and the ones written to his parents from the condemned cell as the shadow of the gallows loomed closer. What they suggest to me is that Garrity was far from a dumb criminal, instead showing an awareness and intelligence of someone mindful of the seriousness and futility of his crime, the price he was going to pay and the realisation of all he was going to lose. Yes, he had committed a horrific crime and nothing could undo what he had done. He was fully aware of his violent actions and the consequences he and his friend would have to pay. In over 40 years of researching and writing true crime, I found Garrity's poignant words, The only regret I have now is that I have wasted 20 years of my life and I have thrown away the other 50 amongst the saddest. Thank you for watching and listening to this episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Your support really is important to help keep the channel growing. Check out my website, stevefielding.com, for information on my books and for links to all the other videos in this series. The website shop also sells copies of the Hangman's Record 3 volume series, plus assorted older titles. We also have copies of volume 1 and 2 of Tales from the Hangman's Record. These are both still available as a paperback and as a Kindle download through the Amazon site. Volume 3 paperback is also due very soon. Please take a look at my new podcast channel, Mostly Murder, which features a variety of true crime cases and is available on Spotify and all the usual platforms. Do you agree the verdict was correct, that justice was done and Jenkins and Garrity both deserve to be hanged? Use the comments below for your thoughts on this case and for suggestions on further episodes. So, until the next time, thank you and goodbye.